Hello and welcome. He's left his mark on the landscape of a number of countries with a holistic approach to architecture and design. But his efforts weren't without challenges, especially when it came to Ground Zero in New York. This week on 101, meet the award-winning architect and designer, Daniel Lieberskind. His family story traces back to Soviet Asia, where his parents met, but carries the tragedy of the Second World War. Daniel Lieberskind was born in Poland at the end of the war to Holocaust survivors. Eighty-five of their family members, including brothers and sisters, weren't so lucky. His parents encouraged his remarkable musical talent, buying him an accordion because a piano was too ostentatious for their neighborhood. He went on to become a virtuoso, and by the time the family moved to Israel, he was performing with leading figures from the world of classical music. In 1959, Liebeskin's family arrived in America, and he chose to study architecture and history. He grew up watching the construction of the World Trade Center buildings, and it was ironic he went on to win the competition to plan the Ground Zero reconstruction after the 9-11 attacks. Liebeskin and his wife, Nina, had already proved their talents as a team with remarkable structures such as the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco. In spite of the politics challenging the Ground Zero project, Liebeskin remains eternally optimistic reminding people that architecture is not an object, it's culture. Daniel, it's a great chance to speak with you. Thank you for your Lovely time. Lovely speaking with you. Thank you so much. Now, you've, you've designed some of the top uh, architectural structures around the world, such as the Jewish Museum in Berlin, the Imperial War Museum North in Manchester in England. Uh, but most significantly, you want the competition uh, to be the master site planner for the new development um, of the World Trade Center site, um, known as Ground Zero, of course, uh, where the attacks of 9-11 took place. Now, the jury didn't actually vote uh, in, in favor of you initially. They, they were choosing instead the Think Team. But there were a lot of people strongly connected with that uh, design of, uh, of yours. Tell, explain that to me. Well, you know, I didn't treat it just as a competition, but what do you do in a place where so many people perished, thousands of people, 98 different nationalities. So it wasn't just about rebuilding the site. How do you balance uh, the sacredness, really, of, of site where people perished and the terrorism that, that it represented? At the same time, establish a foundation for a modern, beautiful New York that is vital, that is interesting, not only looking backwards to the tragedy, but also to the intensity of, of, of and, and, and interaction of New York. A lot of your work has been focused on museums and structures that are connected with your Jewish heritage. Um, do you find a, a greater emotional connection with, with such things? No, it was only because my first project, I never built anything before I built the Jewish Museum in Berlin, uh, was, was, was that. But, you know, I'm involved in shopping centers, university buildings, skyscrapers. You know, uh, you know re architecture represents an entire range uh, of, of emotions. There are tragic ones, but we also celebrate mostly. Now, um, I want to go back into your history. You have an amazing family history. Uh, you were born in Poland at the end of World War II and both your parents were survivors of the Holocaust. Um, what, what do you um, recall of those early years? Because I know you often say that you only think really of anti-Semitism when you think of Poland. No, well, I'm building now in Poland in Warsaw, a beautiful building in front of the Stalin Palace that oppressed the Poles. Uh, but I learned a lot from my parents. You know, I, we, we grew up, I grew up in a dark time in Poland. There was communism, totalitarian mentality, grayness, uh, and, and a fear. And, and I, you know, my parents were kind of resistors to it. They, they were survivors, and they taught me that you should never give up. You should never uh, accept oppression. You should fight for justice and and fight for what you believe. And and. Uh, that's my experience. Yeah, your parents had gone through a lot. They met in Soviet Asia, as it was. That's right. Uh, when they were arrested by Soviet officials um, when the Red Army invaded Poland, they were sent to a Soviet uh, prison camp. And at what point did you come to realize what they'd been through? They lost more than 85 members of their family. You know, it's like direct family, brothers and sisters and everything. Well, I knew it as a kid because we had no family. You know, my parents came from large families, but, uh, but the, you know, we, we used to call, you know, strangers uncle. Uh, so we had no concept of, of an extended family because that's unfortunately what happened in the Holocaust. Uh, people lost everything, and not just uh, possessions, but all connection to the past. So, uh, and, and living in Poland was not easy for us. It, it was difficult. I speak Polish. Uh, I love Polish culture. I, I love uh, Polish identity. But, uh, but th those are not easy times uh, when we lived there in the 50s. How's your relation with your father, Nachman, I think is how you say it. Uh, well, my parents were amazing. My father, Nachman, was a kind of a, in Hebrew called it tzaddik, a, a, a just man. He never held grudges against anybody. He went through the worst experiences, and yet he thought people were wonderful 
human beings. My mother had a, also an amazing personality. You know, when, when we came to New York, I don't know whether you, uh, this story is interesting. She worked as a, in a sweatshop, you know, with exploited women who were immigrants. And she organized a strike one day, a strike to get soap and towels to wash, you know, after this dirty work in this. And she organized a strike. And I said to my mother, who did you organize the strike against? She said, both the unions and the, and, uh, and the um, employers, both. So again, a sense of, of, of something right. It was sad to read that you know you, you, you were desperate to learn the piano. Your parents wanted to encourage you, but they were worried about resentment from the neighbors if they was you know you were seen wheeling a piano through the, the, the neighborhood there or that apartment area where you lived in the uh, in, in the in Poland. Um, so you took up the accordion because they, as a young child because they could put that into a box and, <laughs> and hide it pretty much. It's true. What a destiny. What a fate. You know, I, I wanted a piano. They got me a piano in a box. Uh, they they were scared of their neighbors. You were living in a little courtyard, and, and there was a lot of animosity. Uh, and, but I played it like the piano, and I played. It, uh, classical music, uh, and I didn't treat it as just a folk instrument, but I became a virtuoso on, on a very unusual instrument. You were performing on Polish TV by the age of seven or eight years old. I, exactly. And, and I was also, you know, when I received the America Israel Prize for Music, together with Scott Perelman, you know, Isaac Stern, who was the head of the jury, said, what are you doing on this piano? You're supposed to play the big piano. So I had to tell him the story, but that was my fate. Now, your parents spent a couple of years living in Tel Aviv, uh, by which time that's when you were able to switch to the piano. That's right. Uh, and I know it was actually Isaac Stern, I think, who kept yes, encouraging you. And of course, right. when you won the scholarship, you were even playing alongside the legendary uh, Itzhak uh, Perlman as well. Um, so in terms of uh, what that did for you, that, that adjustment to the instrument that you originally wanted to play, how, how did you take? It was very difficult because, you know, when you are used to playing vertically, it's hard to play horizontally. <laughs> so architecture is more like the accordion because <laughs> it's vertical. <laughs> In the summer of 1959, you and your family moved to New York, um, and you arrived on one of the last immigrant boats uh, that went that came to America, uh, and you ended up at, uh, at the uh, Bronx High School of Science. That's right. Um, how did you adjust to life in the United States after everything you'd been through? Well, we loved it. You know, uh, um, America was sort of uh, welcoming to us. You know, we didn't speak the uh, language. We didn't know anybody, really. We went to the Bronx. Uh, you know, there were families from all over the world. Uh, but it was uh, exciting, and, and it was something sort of very memorable and, and with high kind of energy. Your father worked in a print store down in Lower Manhattan at that time. And as a young lad, you were a relatively young lad, you were able to go and watch the construction of the original World Trade Center. Uh, oh, buildings. absolutely. When, when I went to school to study architecture in New York, we used to go down this, this big pit that, that built the Twin Towers. And it was an amazing sight because it was unprecedented in scale for Lower Manhattan. And, and I saw the foundations being laid uh, of those buildings, and I saw them going up as a student of architecture. Now, you and your wife, uh, Nina Lewis, uh, well, you met Nina Lewis, who became your wife, I said, and, and, and very close business partner in 1966. You were both at a, a Yiddish uh, camp in, <laughs> in upstate New York. Uh, uh, what attracted you to each other? You know, it was love at first sight. Uh, you know, Nina is, you know, not just my partner. She shares, uh, you know, the values we struggle for. soulmate. And she's fantastic. And we just felt it was truly love at first sight. We knew each other for just a few days in the summer. We met each other maybe twice bef after that. And we got married. And uh, her parents, my parents said, you can't get married to somebody you, you knew, you know, for a few weeks. Uh, you know, but it's lasted 40 years. And it's love again and again. And you took a rather unusual honeymoon together. Tell me about that. <laughs> well, I received a scholarship uh, to study the works of Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, he took to travel around the United States. We were too poor to travel by airplane. So uh, in order to make that possible, we, we uh, sort of shared a car with two other students. One was a Jehovah's Witness, and one was a Swedish Lutheran. And we traveled in this car to see every building of Frank Lloyd Wright. It was the most unusual honeymoon, believe me. <laughs> and you actually got around quite a few cities. Too. Oh, absolutely. We went to St. Louis, we went to, to Taliesin, we saw fantastic things, and uh, we, we slept in the car. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because you went on to study architecture and history uh, and, and ended up working in a couple of uh, major firms, but in the end you quit. It, 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 was, you know, it just didn't suit you. Why? You know, I just didn't like the kind of the corporate notion of, of, uh, of you know, the, the, the way offices were organized, they looked to me more like just production, industrial production. I had a very different idea of architecture. And, you know, it was my mother who, in her very wise Hasidic wisdom, said to me, you know, you can, because I want to be an artist, a painter. She said, you can always be an art, uh, artist and artist in architecture, but you cannot be an architect in art. So th you, this way you can kill two birds with one stone or two fish with one hook, as she said. 
Did you manage to get something out of that experience, though, apart from realizing the corporate world wasn't for you or that conformed world wasn't for you? Did, it, uh, did you get something out of it that would help you in your future work and designs? Yes. The, the kind of office, quote unquote, that I would like to have would be totally different. It would be more like an experimental laboratory where, where there's no hierarchy, where, where there's a kind of creative chaos, where everybody's involved in discussion, where people are not just sitting silently at their desks drawing. Is that how it turned out? Absolutely. It is creative chaos. Uh, we, nobody punches a clock. Anybody can do whatever they want. And yet it all works. It's, 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 it's a miracle. When you leave that kind of uh, established environment and try and set up on your own and, and do the kind of more radical, uh, open type of office that you have, how hard is it to get the commissions? How hard is it to be taken seriously? Well, in the beginning, it was very hard. The, the Jewish Museum, which was my first building, you know, it took 13 years, not because I didn't know what I was doing, but because it was just a difficult political process. But of course, once you establish that you are able to do things, that you're not an amateur, that you're an expert, uh, but you're doing it differently. You're not just following the, the, the horde. You're, you're paving your own path uh, rather than the big highway of success. And then other things happen to you, and, and that's been a remarkable thing. Because I never had a goal. You know, most uh, business gurus tell you, have a goal and try to get to it. I had a kind of path, and, and I, I knew that, you know, don't be, uh, you know, lured to the left or right. So stay on this path. You never know where it will lead you, but it's led me to very interesting places. I'm going to ask more about that in a moment, Daniel. Stay with us. More one-on-one uh, -on -one with Daniel Lieberskind in just a moment. <music> Welcome back. You're watching one-on-one. -on -one. We're speaking with renowned architect and designer Daniel Lieberskind. Winning that competition to, to uh, plan the Ground Zero site, uh, the construction site, Memory Foundations, uh, as you named the, the project, it's obviously very significant. Um, considering the emotion and, and the visibility connected with that project, how did you feel that your, your life had changed once that announcement was made? Well, the project is under a magnifying glass. There's not a line you can draw which is not on television, in the press, uh, and you have to do what you believe in. Uh, and, and I actually enjoy, it's difficult because it's highly political, very emotional, there are families of the victims, so many stakeholders, uh, and yet uh, you have to garner consensus in order to rebuild the site in a meaningful way. I was wondering how much that, that, that sort of compromise was involved when you have so much vested parties. How much of your original plan remains? How much you feel you have to give up your original vision? No, I think the original vision is there. Uh, that's what the competition was about. It wasn't about just build, build, uh, building here, a memorial here. How do you shape all of that lower Manhattan, that that 16 acre site, into something that is meaningful, something that will have the memory, but also something that works with streets, with lively buildings, with interesting uh, uh, life on the streets. Well, there's that project, of course, in your first one, the Jewish Museum. But uh, what do you see as the defining moments in your life? What the one, what are the things that really stuck out? Yeah, one of the defining moments, you know, was when I was building the Denver Art Museum. It has this incredible cantilever across the main street, and one day I, I was talking to the workers on the side and. One of the people came over to me and he said, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I used to be a crane operator, earning a lot of money in Florida. But when I saw this building going up, I really love bolting bolts. And I, I took a cut in salary in order to be on this cantilever. And I said, that taught me a lot. Amazing that the construction can inspire someone. And of course, if the workers are not involved as creators, co-creators, what kind of building is it? Yeah, it's interesting. So they actually had the, um, an emotional connection. They could see an emotional connection. Absolutely. Well, I think you have to think not only the, of the final uh, you know, clients and users of the building, you have to think of everybody along the process. Because if they are not creatively engaged, then the building is only a commercial product instead of being really something that communicates a meaningful space. Apart from being a, a competitive environment, and I know you don't, you don't think of yourself as competing as an architect, because you, as you say, you want to, to look at you know, a service or you want to look at uh, a particular project with a much broader view. Um, it's still one of those environments where there's a lot of criticism, where there's a lot of uh, people scrutinizing everything. How do you handle that when, you, when people want to pick apart everything you've done? Well, you have to accept it. You live in an open society. People have a right to say to their views, but you still have to do what you believe in. And of course it's competitive and there are so many tensions, but you have to be sort of, sort of on, a, on a straight line. You, you can't be deflected by just opinions. And of course you have to tolerate them, you have to respect them, and sometimes learn from them as well. When you look at the, the materials available and the technologies available for, uh, for architecture, uh, architect, architectural development, uh, how has, in the time since you started, the technology change that allows you to do designs that, that you could never even dreamt about before? Well, absolutely. When, when I uh, designed the Jewish Museum in Berlin, I did it 
uh, with pencil on a piece of paper. It must have been the last building in the 20th century designed that way because then computers came and, and Berlin was a little bit late. In fact, when they were doing the exhibitions, I got a call from the exhibition designers in Berlin, can you send us you know, the, the, the models of them? So I sent them, I scanned the drawings. And they said, no, no, we want the visual, the virtual model. I said, there isn't one, it's all drawn on paper. So of course, the way architecture is produced now, we can really do things that would have taken 500 years. They could have been produced, the cathedrals or the pyramids, but it took such a long time. Now, with the technologies, with communication, technologies, information, visualization technologies, uh, we can do things that, that are unfathomable in, in another time and of course can be on budget and uh, within a time frame. So that's a huge change, technological change of how architecture is produced. Of course it also leads to banality because you can turn on the computer and play with shapes and create all sorts of fun things which won't have any meaning two years from now. So again, uh, the technology brings with it, a, uh, with it a danger but also a lot of potential to be explored. A lot of people, you know, say, uh, you know, uh, civilians like myself, you know, who, who don't know the inside uh, stuff, Look at buildings that were put put up, you know, hundreds of years ago, and, and look at the the finesse and the quality and and what seems to be an emotion about them, which a lot lot of people say doesn't exist in, uh, nowadays. That people don't build them as they used to. As they You're completely right because to uh, to a great extent, architecture has become just a commodity. You know, it's just a, like a big refrigerator or you know a big version of a car. But I think it's not. It's something human. It has to be handcrafted. It's not just a you know machine to live in. It's a spiritual home. If you spend time, if you're working there, if you're learning there, it has to have a connection to the, to the heart. And I think that's why sustainability isn't just great, clever technology. Of course, it's very important. It's sustainability in memory. If a building is not appreciated, then it's just something that's going to be wasteful. So again, to make buildings that are really sustainable, they have to really be buildings that have a cultural aspiration. So then how do you regard when people are trying to make the tallest tower in the world? We have you know, someone gets up to 800 meters, the next one they're trying 1,000 meters. Frank Gehry, I think, think talked years ago about the, the mile-high skyscraper. You know, it's not the height of a building. It's the height of an aspiration that, that counts. Height of a building is just a mechanical thing, but aspiration has no limit. Now, you have three children, uh, Lev, Jacob, Norm, and uh, Rachel. How do they cope with uh, the craziness of the fact that both you and uh, your wife are so uh, into this, you know, the, tra the travel, the project? You both are so Im immersed in this uh, crazy lifestyle across the world. <laughs> well, you know, they're all different. You know, Lev is a humanist. Uh, Noam, uh, the, middle, the, the middle son, is a, a cosmologist. Uh, a, a, and mathematician, and Rachel is a visual artist. Uh, she's still in, the, you know, in, in college. So each one of them has, takes a different direction, but they kind of share, I think, whether it's the stars that have their architecture, the humanistic world, or the world of uh, art. Uh, it, it's 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 one world. I was fascinated to read because they've lived between Europe uh, and different countries in Europe and America, as you've all traveled so much, that they, they're multilingual. Yes. And they all speak in different languages, either with each other and even with you sometimes, depending on what they want to get across. That's absolutely true. I mean, they, they're fluent speakers of, of, of Italian, of German, of other languages. And it's, it's true. Once you displace the kids so often as we did, as parents, which seems, uh, you know, ir in retrospect, irresponsible, you also create a, another idea of the world, that the world is interesting, that it's not just where you live, but over there are also interesting people and that risk and, and you know immersing yourself not in some private school but in a public school in Milan or a public school in Berlin you know gives you kind of in a, in a long run a better advantage of, of knowing that the world is a fantastic place. It's fantastic education yeah. It is it's, you learn a lot and in order to survive uh, otherwise you know what would you do? <laughs> well, your history was of course very different through those years who were your mentors who did you look up to? Well, I looked up to some of my teachers, some of my great, John Haydock was a famous architect, Peter Eisenhower was my teacher, uh, Richard Meyer. I had great teachers, uh, but uh, I looked up into other fields because architecture is not really about itself. You know, the way, you know, uh, uh, writing is not about writing, it's about telling a story. Uh, so, yeah, I was inspired by artists, uh, by scientists, and we have to remember that architecture is a liberal art. You know, it's not just a scientific uh, infrastructural art of engineering and, and, and so on. It's about music, it's about poetry, it's about tragedy, it's about lyrical uh, dimensions. It's about astronomy. It's about mathematics, geometry. And it's interesting you say it that way. I know you see music, or at least you were quoted as saying music is all about playing, and that sometimes that, you know, uh, you are after more abstract and intellectual thought, which is what uh, architecture and design could give you. Uh, and, uh, and you were quoted as saying that your chance to be a great p uh, pianist died with the anti-Semitism of Poland. Um, and I was wondering, do you ever regret not pursuing a career in music, considering you'd 
achieved such a high standard. I mean, you played Carnegie Hall. That's quite an achievement. Well, you know, my wife still, you know, Nina still tells me, it's true, I used to earn more money as a child than I do now because as a virtual supporter, you get, to, I used to support my parents, but I don't regret at all because I take that musical experience into what I do now. And I, I think, you know, architecture is so much about music. It's about acoustics. It's about uh, the sense of performance as well. So, you know, it, it's, you know, everything, leads you to somewhere where, where you didn't expect to be. And of course, Nina had a background in politics. Absolutely. Did she ever regret that, I wonder? <laughs> no, never. You know, half of my buildings would never be built without her genius to know that, right. you know, politics means the city. It, it is the politeia. And, and without that ability to communicate, you can't get anything done. Well, of course, you had to deal with the politics of the World Trade Center site as well. So, well, absolutely, and 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 it's st still there. And and I think that's what we have to remember: that consensus and democracy is not something negative. It's this negotiated way to bring something isn't some mediocre performance. It's what really a great city is. It's not just done by one person. And I enjoyed that, and I learned a lot from it. Now, of course, you and Nina, uh, uh, you know, have such a close relationship for so long. She describes you as not having the oversized ego of some other architects. Uh, what is it you think you most most complement each other with? Well, she's, a v you know, I tend to be a dreamer sometimes. She's very practical. We are really yin and yang. You know, but even our birthdays are exactly on the opposite sides, sides of the zodiac. So uh, we are different. When I see, you know, white cheese is black. When I see good cheese is bad. So we are really opposites in, in every sense. Danielle, is there a, a, a project you would like to do? Is there something you've had in mind that you'd love to do and you haven't had a chance to until now? You know, I've never been one of those kinds of architects who just dreams up a project and wants a commission. I always think architecture is about a kind of, in a way, a service. People have to need something. They need housing. They need a school. They need, you know, an airport. Then I need to rephrase it. Is there ever a need you wish you could have had to fulfill? I, I, you know, I just said the word airport. You know, I travel so much, and I think most airports are so boring and so cold. I, I'd love to actually do an airport, which is some, some would be something like a home. I spend so much time in airports. I'll look forward to your airport. <laughs> I can promise you that. Now, um, you know, people will be able to admire your buildings, of course, long after you've gone. But is there something for which you'd like to be remembered? Is there something you'd want to be your legacy, say, apart from what you've left behind physically? Well, I think the sense that the world uh, is about freedom, that, that we are not trapped into a singular formula, that a city hasn't been done, done forever in that way, that, that we can be emancipated into new spaces, new ways of thinking, uh, and new directions of, 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 of spirit. Daniel Liebeskind, I wish you a lot of power. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much.